2021. My name is Gail Adele Veith, and I'm the Regional Coordinator of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace for Central America and the Caribbean. I'm so happy to be your moderator today. This webinar is hosted by the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, IAFLP, which is a part of the International Summit Council for Peace of the Universal Peace Federation. The Women's Federation for World Peace International is pleased to support the IAFLP. We will be hearing from seven honorable women today, all of whom lead, multitask, nurture, heal, inspire, guide, and most of all, love. Also with us is a very special gentleman who helped to make all of this possible. We will be hearing from him shortly. But now, let's begin with a short video to introduce the IAFLP. One year after its creation, the first General Assembly of the ISPC took place at the 2020 World Summit and had for theme the realization of an ideal world of peace centered on coexistence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. It brought together nearly 7,000 high-ranking personalities from 171 countries, including 120 former and current heads of state and government. The former Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, delivered the welcoming address. Several heads of state and government then highlighted the vision of the ISPC through its speeches. I'd like to thank and extend my special gratitude to Dr. Hak Cha Han for hosting this summit and commend her long-standing commitment to peace and reconciliation. Por eso me permito felicitar a los fundadores de la UPF porque están haciendo lo que otros solo hablan. The mother of peace encouraged participants to place God at the center of everything and called for the realization of peace in the world. Urinan. In addition, first ladies from several countries came together with the same heart and determination as their husbands. Thanks to the ISCP in December 2019, the Republic of Palau successfully organized the Asia Pacific First Ladies Summit, which brought together 80 women leaders, including 20 first ladies. These ladies launched the International Association of First Ladies for Peace in order to solve with a mother's heart the fundamental problems of the world and thus spread the women's peace movement. We must look into ourselves, draw upon that value, and work together as women traditionally what, to create solutions to, ch to challenge the threat and that our families are facing in our homes and our nations. Let's take this uh, opportunity to build strong relationship and partnership for our future and for the future of our children. The mother of peace is determined to achieve a world of harmony and peace with a motherly love. Yes. Accompanied by the Association of First Ladies, they will broaden the horizon of a world of peace through close collaboration with the ISCP. That was a beautiful video. Actually, some of us here today were there at the World Summit in Korea. There were 7,000 people. And just as the pandemic was breaking out, miraculously, not one of us got sick. It was really something. So the next five speakers will be speaking in English. Today, we're so honored to begin our event with our Dr. Julia Moon. Dr. Moon is the president of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. An internationally renowned ballerina, 
She is also the chairperson of the Universal Culture Foundation, coordinating the operations of the Universal Art Center, the Universal Ballet Academy, and the Kirov Academy of Ballet in Washington, DC, and Korea. Dr. Moon is also the daughter-in-law of our founders of the Universal Peace Federation. Dr. Moon, welcome. Thank you for that warm introduction. Your Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a warm welcome to all who have joined this evening's webinar. On behalf of our co-founder, Dr. Hak Chahan Moon, I am truly delighted and honored to meet the First Ladies of the Bahamas, Belize, Trinidad and Tobago, Guatemala, and our special guest panelists from Honduras at this prestigious virtual webinar today entitled The Global Role of Women, Contributions to Peace and Development. The International Association of First Ladies for Peace, IAFLP, is a project of the International Summit Council for Peace of the Universal Peace Federation. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. Um, I have been on many stages throughout the world, but somehow I feel like I have butterflies in my stomach as if I were going on a stage. Uh, it's so wonderful to be with together with so many wonderful panelists today. Um, I, our ILFLP in collaboration with the Women's Federation for World Peace brings together current and former first ladies throughout the world to respond to today's challenges. Drawing upon their unique experience and wisdom as women leaders and role models, they serve their countries and their societies in very essential and significant ways. First and foremost, I would like to express my deep appreciation to ESCLAN, spouses of the CARICOM Leaders Action Network. I am so inspired by your incredible work to improve the lives of women and their families in the region and its implication worldwide. I feel that we share a common vision for a more caring and equitable world. With us today are Her Excellency, Mrs. Sibeline Patricia Minis, who chairs the organization, as well as Her Excellency, Mrs. Rima Harrison Carmona and Her Excellency, Mrs. Kim Simplis Barrow, all of whom have worked to create a Caribbean free from HIV, gender-based violence, teenage pregnancy, and cervical cancer with long-term goals set forth by the global community, including former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's Every Woman, Every Child Global Initiative. I would also like to extend my warm greetings to Her Ex Excellency, Mrs. Patricia Maroquin de Morales of Guatemala and Mrs. Iroshka Elvir de Nasralla of Honduras. Your work towards building a better Central America together with your husbands is greatly admired and appreciated. It is always a joy to see efforts that unite and celebrate the hard work of women, whether it be small or monumental. This first IAFLP 2021 event in this region was made possible thanks to the dynamic leadership of Dr. Charles Young and Mrs. Gail Veith, our moderator today. Thank you so much for bringing together this incredible group of women leaders. I would also like to acknowledge and give special thanks to the Global Women's Peace Network, a project of WFWPI since 2013. It has helped lay the foundation upon which the Women's Federation for World Peace could contribute in Central America and the Caribbean. Women with their maternal nature are natural peacemakers who can teach their families to be a little kinder towards one another. This is the true essence of peace building that will naturally spill over to our larger communities. We may feel alone at times, but the power we have is undeniable 
when we come together as we have today. IAFLP started at the World Summit in Korea in 2020 for this very purpose of bridging the mother's heart to world affairs. The loving and sacrificial leadership of women working together to empower our youth in goodness, build cohesive communities with men, and establish models of ethical and balanced leadership has never been more needed to address today's challenges. Dr. Hak Jahan Moon, known throughout the world as the mother of peace, and her late husband, Reverend Dr. Sun Myung Moon, were both born in North Korea. Mother Moon is now spearheading an effort to realize the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. It has already been 70 years since the Korean War took place. Sadly, 10 million Korean families are still torn apart and divided into North and South by an ideological divide. Mother Moon reaches out, not as a politician, but as a mother, a mother of peace, to nurture, heal, counsel, beautify, educate, and to most of all, as Gail also said, to love. It is with this same mindset and heart that we gather to address the challenges of Central America and the Caribbean. With your region's diversity of languages, cultures, and ethnicities, you have had to learn to appreciate and cooperate with each, with each other in amazing ways. Let us look to the bigger picture and work together to fulfill our dream of a peaceful world of one family under God. We look forward to working closely with you uh, together in the future to advance this noble cause. Once again, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today. May this webinar contribute to building lasting peace in the world. I would like to close with a quote from our co-founder, Mother Moon. Now, women and men should play a major role in world history by serving alongside each other like the wheels of a great engine, pulling the construction of a peaceful world forward. Instead of a century of force and technology, the role of women has become more important at the center of creating a century of culture through love, peace, and revolution of the heart. I sincerely hope that all of you follow the path of a true mother, a true wife, a true daughter, and a true woman leader in building a unified world overflowing with true freedom, peace, and happiness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beautiful. Dr. Moon, I could listen to you forever. You're like <laughs> therapy for my heart and mind. You've challenged us that as women leaders, we have the ability to solve problems in ways that men cannot. And to support, we want to support and work with you to that end. Thank you, Dr. Moon. Thank you, Thank you so much. Next, I'm very pleased to introduce a very special gentleman. He is the chairman of the Universal Peace Federation for Central America and the Caribbean. Incidentally, UPF is our umbrella organization and Dr. Charles Yang also chairs the Middle East Peace Initiative and he's a director of the Washington Times Foundation. He's also been a longtime special assistant to the founders of UPF. Let us welcome Dr. Charles Yang. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Ambassadors for Peace, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and good evening. Buenos tardes, buenas noches. It is my great honor and privilege to welcome our distinguished panelists on behalf of the Universal Peace Federation. We sincerely thank you for attending this conference despite your busy schedules. UPF is an NGO in general consultative status 
with the Economic and the Social Council of the United Nations. It was founded in New York in 2005 by Dr. Hakja Han Moon and her late husband, Reverend Dr. Son Myung Moon. After each launching through several world tours, it became the most active organization under the UN umbrella. Since its founding, the UPF has established chapter in more than 120 nations over the years. With the onset of COVID-19, the UPF has been sponsoring a series of online seminars. This webinar is a part of these ongoing sessions. The UPF recently finalized the establishment of seven associations organized under its vision. The International Summit Council for Peace, ISCP, was launched on February 8th, 2019 in Seoul, Korea, right before the COVID-19 pandemic began. Upon the foundation of a series of conferences known as the World Summit for Peace and Development, which have been held since 2013. The inaugural event of the ISCP was attended by 120 current and former heads of state, along with 7,000 international leaders from politics, religion, education, the media, academia, youth, and women. The President of Guatemala, His Excellency Jimmy Morales, and the President of Trinidad and Tobago, His Excellency Ansoni Camona, both contributed greatly in the initiation of the ISCP representing of our region. We are honored to have both of their wives, first ladies here tonight. Today's conference hosts the International Association of First Ladies for Peace, IAFLP, is a project of the ISCP. This was established with the same principles and goals of ISCP for centering on women's motherly, nurturing, and caring heart. I would especially like to appreciate spouses of CARICOM Leaders Action Network, as clan under the leadership of Her Excellency Sibylline Patricia Minis of the Bahamas, which is one of the beautiful nations in the Caribbean. I can never forget the beautiful colors of the blue sky crystal clear blue ocean and white sandy beaches. Actually, I have visited there to assist Mother Moon's speaking tour. And thank you, Her Excellency, Mrs. Vero, former First Lady of Belize, one of the beautiful country, the founding chair of ESCLAN. Thank you for joining us today. I trust the ESCLAN will be a great platform to address and resolve the issues of our society beyond CARICOM. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are honored to have Dr. Julia Moon on behalf of the founder, all the way from Korea, where it is early morning. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for joining us. During these difficult times, UPF has initiated a variety of activities following the Sustainable Development Goals envisioned under the UN's guidelines. Through our online peace talk conferences, we have endeavored to discover the real factors and offer effective solutions. UPF is also cooperating with various governments with volunteer activities, such as food distribution and the medical services. I just wanted to share some highlights of recent UTF, UPF activities. Gentlemen, Rally of Hope series, please bear with me. Okay, so one, uh, one million uh, Rally of Hope series was launched in August 2020 and then held every other month. The three major themes addressed by the keynote speakers were interdependence, mutual prosperity, and universal values. Some goals of the rallies were to discuss solutions 
eradicating poverty and uh, inequality, ending religious and racial conflict, establishing the international security. The keynote speakers at the first rally of hope were Dr. Hak Jahamun, co-founder of UPF, known as Mother of Peace, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, the President of Senegal, the Prime Minister of Niger, the former Prime Minister of Canada, President of Guatemala, His Excellency Jimmy Morales, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Honorable Ban Ki-moon, former President of the Senate of Japan, Honorable Sui Chidate, former Speakers of U.S. House Representatives, Honorable Newt Kingrich, and the Reverend Paula White, President Trump's Special Advisor. The second Rally of Hope was held on September 27th. The speaker was President of South Dome, former Vice President of USA, His Excellency Dick Cheney and Dan Quayle, the President of Europe Commission, Jose Barroso, President of Cambodia, Jonathan Guller, and, uh, and two religious leaders from our region, Roman Catholic Cardinal, Kelvin Perez from Dominica, head of Lutheran Church, International Bishop Yuri uh, Munip Yunan. The third rally hall was held in November 22nd. The speakers were President of Ethiopia, Woman President, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, President of South Sudan, President of Liberia, Prime Minister of Canada again, Prime Minister of Belgium, uh, President of Assembly. The fourth rally of hall was the launching ceremony of WCLC, World Clergy Leadership Conference in USA. More than 1,000 religious leaders from around the world convened for the first World Christian Leadership Conference convocation in New York on December 27th to promote global peace and reconciliation among religions. The fifth rally of hope was held exactly a month ago, February 27. Keynote speakers were President of Nigeria, His Excellency Muhammad Buhari. As you know, Nigeria is one of the largest countries in Africa, number seven a large country in terms of population out of the world. Uh, Vice President Michael Pence of USA, he just stepped down months ago. Probably this was his public trip after a step down from his coach. Vice President of India, Hamid Ansari, he served for 10 years as a Vice President of the largest country in India. Prime Minister of Guyana, Mark Phillips from our region's representative. There were two Nobel Peace Laureates, former President of South Africa and Director of UN's World Food Program. So we are ongoing to have the sixth rally of hope May 2nd. <laughs> Hopefully all of you join in this significant rally. Even Latin America region have been initiating many virtual conferences over the year. This Latin America summit was held in Dominican Republic on December 2019. Some current and former heads of state was uh, first ladies and uh, president of assembly, civil leaders around 500 Latin America issues of our regions beyond the world. This conference is keep going on with your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, history is clearly divided in many aspects between the two eras of before and after COVID-19. We may call the eras before Corona and uh, after Corona. The coronavirus spread rapidly beyond race, religion, and the national borders. Although communities, countries, and the world were isolated from each other, this isolation cannot continue. We must find a way to rebuild civilization through new ideas and cooperating with one another beyond the national boundaries. We will do our best to help this region in preparing for the post-corona era by continuing to foster redevelopment in partnership with other nations. We must create a new paradigm to welcome in the age of AC after Corona. I believe that we will gain new wisdom and insight from this prestigious panelists today. Once again, our sincere appreciation to all of you 
for your participation in this webinar. Although this is a difficult time in human history, this too shall pass. Let us go through this dark tunnel with hope and vision and aim for a bright new community, new nation, and new world. Thank you very much. Mucha gracias. Dr. Yang, the pictures of those world leaders coming together for world peace is so incredibly hopeful. Thank you so much. And now I have the pleasure, I've been looking forward to this all day. I really wanted to meet Her Excellency, Mrs. Sibeline Patricia Minnis from the Bahamas. Mrs. Minnis, I'm so happy that you're here. I was looking forward to this all day. Mrs. Minnis is not only the wife of the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, but she also holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from the prestigious Bethune Cookman University. As chairwoman of the Spouses of the Caribbean Leaders Network, ESPLAN, Mrs. Minnis is also committed to working with the first ladies and spouses of heads of government of the Caribbean community to champion the Karawak Initiative. Your Excellency, Mrs. Minnis, we are so happy to have you with us here today. The floor is yours. Madam Chair, fellow First Ladies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is indeed an honor to be a part of this panel and join revered First Ladies in the continued quest for global peace and development. History has shown that change often occurs through the collected effort of individuals standing in unity and working synergistically for a cause. It is common practice for the spouses of global leaders to take interest and champion the cause for issues that impact their people. I am mindful of the significant contributions that former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt made towards the drafting of the United Nation, UN Declaration of Human Rights and subsequent served as the first chairman of the Human Rights Commission. Mrs. Roosevelt was a firm advocate for human rights and will always be remembered for her efforts in promoting anti-lynching legislation and her membership in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Today we also remember and appreciate the work of former First Ladies Betty Ford and Abigail Fillmore, who supported the Equal Rights Amendment, including rights for women, and promoted education and learning respectively. The early contribution of these First Ladies and others have ignited a flame that continues to be fueled by First Ladies of today. Ladies, we must continue to influence and advocate for unity, equality, rights and peace in our society and by extension at a global level. It is imperative that we further develop and endorse resolution and support amendments that will bring about desired change, promote peace and protect the vulnerable. There are many people around the world, particularly women and children, that are deprived of basic human rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of worship, equitable access to education and health care, and most notably, a living environment free from war and conflict. In addition, 
food security, access to clean water, and diverse diseases remain a major issue for many communities. My fellow sisters, let us be mindful of the strength we possess. Let us continue to advocate for the betterment of vulnerable people. As women leaders, we must continue to dialogue with legislators and decision makers to induce change. Eliminate inequality, alleviate hardship, resolve conflict, and ultimately prevent violence and war. Likewise, it is also our duty to develop and implement strategies and subsequently measured outcome to ensure that persons are positively impacted from the work that we do. Most noteworthy, we must continue to use our voices to sound the alarm and speak up and speak out for those whose voices may never be heard. Let us not wait for others to make decisions while women and children around the world continue to be raped, massacred, abducted, and coerced into early marriage as child brides or made to become soldiers well before adolescence. In this 21st century, children should not experience death of their parents, loss of limbs, or loss of life due to conflict, war, or terroristic activity than that can possibly be resolved. We must use our good offices to come together and partner with like-minded individuals and organizations whose goals are to address community-based concerns and global issues. Most importantly, we must ultimately seek after resolutions and promote reconciliation and peace. We must be bold, steadfast, and persistent in our pursuit for peace. I am mindful of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in St. Matthew's Gospel, which states, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. As true citizens of a global community, let us always endeavor to overcome evil with good, aiming for all persons, especially children, to live in a land of harmony and peace. Ladies, women with great passion can make the impossible happen. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Your Excellency, that was so beautiful. I love your accent. It's so different to the one here in Barbados. Oh, it has a little you. New York flair to it. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, I, I truly believe, yes, with the passion that we have, we can make the impossible happen. And so right. thank you for inviting me and having me here with you. I look forward to continual relationship in this regard. Thank you. Her Excellency oh. Sibeline Patricia Minnis has asked us to advocate for unity and peace at a global level, to be mindful of the strength women possess, and to advocate for the betterment of vulnerable people. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Thank you. You're welcome. And now to the former First Lady of Belize, her Excellency Mrs. Kim Simplis Barrow. She's a Belizean activist for women and children's rights and development. Mrs. Barrow is a philanthropist and was the founding chair of ESPLAN. She was also appointed as the special envoy for women and children in Belize. Mrs. Simplis Barrow, welcome. Good evening, distinguished First Ladies, invited guests. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to share a few words 
with you this evening on this very important topic. So gentlemen, a discussion on the subject of peace is always a timely one. However, in a world fraught with grief, anxiety, and many other upheavals due to COVID-19 pandemic, including increased numbers of cases of gender-based violence and child abuse, in a world where as this global health crisis rages, there's still armed conflicts in many. In a world where even as this global health crisis rages, there are still armed conflicts in many corners of the world. We still hear of incidences of violence in our communities on a daily basis. In the current climate, peace is a much needed commodity. And I'm a firm believer that women have a vital role to play in its achievement. Since, 20, since the year 2000, the United Nations, uh, through its Security Council Resolution 1325, has been calling for meaningful inclusion of women in peace negotiation, peace building, peacekeeping, humanitarian response, and in post-conflict reconstruction. And it stands to reason as women participants in peace processes are usually focused on reconciliation, justice, education, and economic development rather than the gains or spoils of conflict. There is strong empirical evidence that the participation of women is an essential component to achieving lasting peace. And lasting peace is of course a prerequisite for sustainable development. Conflict on any scale at any level disrupts or even shatters lives and stunts personal, community, and even national development, as the case may be. Women experience conflicts differently from men, be it in wars or in violence at the community yeah, level. Women are not the majority combatants, but still bear the brunt of the discord. Women and their children make up the majority of civilian casualties in armed conflict. We are the vast majority of the victims when sexual violence is used as a method of war. We are the ones who lose our sons to gang violence. We are the majority victims of gender-based violence in our societies. We are the ones who must keep our families together and try to move on. So women can bring a different understanding and insight into the causes of conflict and possible solutions. Women as survivors of conflict as witnesses to violence, as mediators to ending dispute, as cultural barriers and providers for their families in the midst of conflict, all have huge contribution towards breaking the vicious cycle of conflict. There are many examples, including in my own country, of the powerful role that mothers and grandmothers can play in stemming the tide and even resolving community violence and conflict. I hasten to clarify that I am not dismissing the importance of men in advancing peace and development. I am making the point that gender balance is important. Globally, however, women's peace building potential has not been fully utilized. This is due in large part to the, their absence or lack of representation from the decision-making processes. That is why I believe that it is important that women are at the decision-making tables at all levels. Hence the reason that I have advocated for and supported women running for elected office. In fact, there is an intricate and inextricable link between gender equality and the empowerment of women and the attainment of peace and sustainable development. Inequality in its many manifestations is one of the root causes of conflict and violence. So to my mind, working, working on issues Thank that you, advance Karen. human rights, gender equality, and empower women and girls is in effect working towards peace and development. This is why during my tenure as Belize's Special Envoy for Women and Children, I worked ardently on critical areas that advance equality and empowerment for women and girls. Okay focusing mainly on gender-based violence and women's economic empowerment. I successfully advocated for the passage of legislation that offer better protection for victims of sexual abuse and exploitation, human trafficking, and cyberbullying. 
During my tenure, my office spearheaded and collaborated with government, the private sector, civil society partners, as well as international development agencies in hosting training activities, conferences, rallies, and other public education activities to sensitize, foster a common understanding, and execute actions to advance women's rights. I strongly believe that the First Ladies have an important role to play as high-level advocates for the strengthening of political will, the mobilization of resources, implementation of policies and programs that make a difference in the lives of people, promote equality, and ultimately create peaceful and secure societies. This belief was one of the motivating factors that motivated me in 2014 to side event at the United Nations General Assembly. That was a global call to action on women's and girls' financial health. This event brought together First Ladies from around the world, UN agencies and international civil society organizations to discuss concrete actions that we could undertake in our individual countries and collectively. This belief also motivated me to rally my colleague First Ladies in the Caribbean to form the Spouses of Caricom Caribbean Leaders Action Network, SPAN, to focus on gender-based violence, adolescent pregnancy, survival cancer, HIV, and mental health. Let me pause here and say how glad I am to see the current chairperson of SPAN, Mrs. Minnis, and Mrs. Rima Carmona, another of the founding members here with us this evening. Among the many accomplishments of SPANS are the two UN General Assembly side events for the First Ladies on gender equality topics. Even though my tenure as Belize's Special Envoy and First Lady are completed, I still continue as an advocate on gender equality and women's empowerment and will be amplifying my efforts through a new NGO called Women for Peace, Justice, and Equality. I am very pleased to be able to partake in any discussion that promotes peace and development in our world. We owe it to our children and the generations to come to leave them a better world, a peaceful world where all human beings are respected, recognized as equals, and allowed to fulfill his or her full potential and women need to be standing shoulder to shoulder with men for us to truly achieve this goal. Thank you. Your Excellency, Your Excellency, if you fight for women and children the way you fight with the technology, you are gonna make a huge difference. <laughs> All jokes aside, Mrs. Simplice Barrow reminded us that since women and children suffer the most in conflicts, they have unique insights as to its causes and should have an important role at high level decision making tables. Thank you, Mrs. Barrow, you are a trooper. <laughs> and now our distinguished guest, her Excellency Mrs. Rima Carmona is an economist who served as First Lady of Trinidad and Tobago. She's a strong advocate for women and youth empowerment. The fight against child marriage and adolescent pregnancy and her incredible work was recognized at the 72nd session of the United Nations General Assembly when she became one of the five first ladies who were presented the Global Leadership Impact Award at the International Conference on Gender and Sustainability. Welcome, Mrs. Carmona. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, every woman, regardless of demographic or station in life, has a vested interest and defining role in the maintenance and sustenance of peace and development within the individual countries and in the world. Peace and development are inextricably linked. Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General, posited, and I quote, there is no peace without development, 
and no development without peace, end quote. Integral to any developmental agenda must be woman empowerment, gender equality, fair and just treatment, and gender justice. The UN has stated matter-of-factly, and I quote, woman leadership and participation in peace building is prerequisite for the fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In other words, without women's participation, we will not achieve lasting peace. And without the stability of peace, we will not achieve sustainable development. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected women and girls tremendously and focus we must on its impact on the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals SDGs and the Global Agenda 2030, particularly SDG 5, Gender Equality. Adherence by all states to SDG 5, as well as its targets, would be instrumental in women making even greater contributions to peace and development as an empowering, enabling environment is critical to enhancing women's contributions in these areas. In the midst of this health crisis, women together with informed and progressive men must continue a social advocacy that ensures that the pandemic response is not used as a pretext to roll back, delay, or abandon implementation of the goals and targets of SDG 5 since resources are now being redirected from women empowerment initiatives and gender-based social services to combating COVID-19. Recalling the United Nations Secretary Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security is not enough. It must be actualized by affirmative institutionalized action. This legally binding document requires parties in a conflict to prevent violation of women's rights, to support women's participation in peace negotiations and in post-conflict reconstruction, and to protect women and girls from wartime sexual violence. There has been a dereliction of Resolution 1325. If we are serious about engaging women in building peace and championing development, why is it between 1992 to 2018, women were only 13% of negotiators, 3% of mediators, and 4% of signatories in major peace processes. UN Women observed that, and I quote, women do groundbreaking work for justice and security, yet they continue to be sidelined in formal peace processes. To demonstrate this abject lacuna, at the present peace process between the Afghanistan government and the Taliban, there is only one woman among many men. As we watch with horror, the continued civil unrest in places like Yemen, the obscene kidnappings of young girls in Nigeria, and the perennial violence, for example, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and most recently, the atrocities being committed in Myanmar and Ethiopia, it certainly makes one wonder whether there is a dismantling of Resolution 1325 taking place through sheer institutional indifference, apathy, or by governmental design. And what of the UN General Assembly Resolution on Women Disarmament, Arms Control, and Non-Proliferation? It does appear to me that these two pivotal resolutions are observed more in their breach than in their implementation in diverse corners of the globe. Many societies continue to be burdened by discriminatory cultural norms entrenched with gender inequality. World leaders need to institutionalize equitable access to opportunity for women in the spheres of business, finance, and entrepreneurship to sustain progressive economic development. In 2018, at the World Trade Organization, Buenos Aires Declaration on Trade and Women's Economic Empowerment, it was highlighted that steps to empower women economically are happening slowly, but not systematically. In the area of global trade, we have had some small progress in helping women enter global markets, 
either directly or as part of global supply chains. Women are not less capable at exporting. Instead, they often lack access to information, finance, and technology. The problem is not that the exporter is female, but that the system is not attuned to ensuring women have the same access to these opportunities as men. As an economist, I take note of Monica Masunda, a Zambian entrepreneur manufacturing locally sourced nutritional foods and selling to the burgeoning health food sector, is an inspiring East African story. Monica's vision is to change the eating habits of African youth by offering them affordable and nutritious food options made from local products. As an economist and advocate against NCDs, her story is truly enlightening. Monica received assistance from the International Trade Center's She Trades Initiative with the aim of connecting 3 million women in Africa to international markets by 2021 by working with governments, corporations, and business support organizations to unlock markets for women to trade. This roadmap to development will create peace in the region. It is an accepted norm that there can be no peace without justice and the rule of law. And the International Criminal Court, ICC, is the guardian and custodian for the international rule of law. In 2021, the ICC is the only international court where there is an equal number of male and female judges. This is significant for several reasons, bearing in mind that the jurisdiction of the ICC includes the prosecution of the most criminally responsible for the commission of the gravest crimes of humanity, including genocide and war crimes. And we need to be reminded that in prosecuting and trying these crimes, offenses such as the rape of women being used as a tool of war, not only will the victims receive justice, but there will be an end to impunity for said crimes. To ensure success at building peace and development at the multilateral level, nation states must ensure that women's voices are heard and women's rights are addressed and invoked. Women's inclusion in peace negotiations and development agendas often contribute to policies, agreements, and initiatives that work that are fruitful, productive, and enduring. I thank you. Are a wealth of information. Mrs. Carmona reminded us of one of the horrific consequences of war is the sexual abuse of women and this is why peace is so very vital. Now, the last two speakers will be speaking in Spanish, but if you don't mind, I'd like to take one minute, um, adjust your down at the bottom of the screen where it says interpretation. You can choose your language there, choose English, if you're an English speaker. But before we go to our two Spanish ladies, for those of you who are not familiar with the Women's Federation for World Peace International, I would just like to explain that um, it's been 30 years that the Women's Federation for World Peace was founded and it has more than 120 national chapters worldwide, as well as a 27 year history of long-term humanitarian projects that address a wide range of issues related to improving the lives of women, children, and the family. So for those of you who are not familiar, I just wanted to put that in. So now we will go to our Spanish speaking first ladies. Um, we have the pleasure of welcoming her Excellency, Mrs. Patricia Marroquin de Morales. Mrs. de Morales was a panelist at the World Summit 2019 in Korea. She served with distinction as the First Lady of Guatemala and taking her post as First Lady in an era of mass migration for Guatemala. 
Mrs. Marroquin de Morales focused on supporting migrant families through programs such as For the Love of Migrants and Migrant Family Units. Mrs. de Morales. Reciban un cordial saludo de mi parte y de mi familia desde mi linda Guatemala, tierra de la eterna primavera. Agradezco a la UPF y a su presidenta, la doctora Moon, por su labor en la búsqueda del desarrollo y la paz mundial, y también por su cordial invitación para aportar mis puntos de vista respecto al papel global de la mujer y sus contribuciones a la paz y el desarrollo de la humanidad. Empecemos. ¿Qué es la mujer? Esta es una pregunta básica que todo ser humano debe hacerse y responderse. Para empezar, la mujer es un ser humano, hija, hermana, amiga, esposa, madre, abuela, al igual que el hombre, con la respectiva diferencia de sexo. A partir de hija, puesto que el hombre será hijo, hermano, amigo, etc. Es decir que la mujer es el equivalente exacto, ni más ni menos que el varón. Y cierro, y cierro esta pequeña introducción con la frase bíblica, varón y hembra los creó. Yo creo en la creación, es decir, creo en que Dios creó al hombre y a la mujer y que los hizo iguales, con capacidades similares y funciones complementarias. Funciones complementarias que al unirlas dan resultados que por separado ninguno de los dos, varón o hembra, pueden dar. Por ejemplo, tener hijos. Dos hombres nunca podrán procrear un hijo, así como dos mujeres nunca lo podrán hacer. Siguiendo la narrativa de la creación, la mujer es ayuda idónea al hombre, tal como el hombre lo es a la mujer. Entonces, el desarrollo de la humanidad se debe tanto al hombre como a la mujer. Es un hecho, lamentablemente, que durante milenios el papel de la mujer no fue reconocido, pero en la actualidad, en muchas latitudes se reconoce el rol que la mujer ha desempeñado en la historia de la humanidad y poco a poco se han abierto espacios para la participación de la mujer en diversos campos y actividades que nos permiten demostrar que somos suficientemente capaces de realizar cualquier tarea que se nos presente. En antaño, la mujer ejercía la administración del hogar, y esto de ninguna manera demerita las capacidades de la mujer. Al contrario, muestra la capacidad que la mujer tiene de administrar los recursos y de educar a las siguientes generaciones. Gracias al avance de la humanidad y la necesidad de la autorrealización de nosotras las mujeres, salimos de la casa en donde permanecimos por costumbre, necesidad, temor o por algún poder tirano a generar oportunidades en otras áreas, donde hemos demostrado que somos capaces. Prueba de ello es que cada día son más las mujeres que ocupan posiciones de poder y que ganan premios en ciencias, literatura, movimientos de pacificación en todos los campos del conocimiento y de la vida. Cuentan una historia de Marie Curie, ganadora del Premio Nobel de Física junto a su esposo en 1903 que en una entrevista el reportero haciendo referencia a la fama de inteligencia que precedía a su esposo le preguntó, ¿qué se siente ser la pareja de una persona tan inteligente? A lo que Marie Curie respondió, no sé, pregúntenle a mi esposo. Pero la historia no termina ahí. En 1911 ella ganó el premio Nobel de Química, convirtiéndose en la primera persona en conseguir dos veces el preciado galardón de los Nobel. La moraleja de esta historia es, los hombres son tan inteligentes como las mujeres, lo que ambos necesitan es una oportunidad. Se dice fácil que ahora las mujeres tenemos más espacios y oportunidades, pero abrir brecha para conseguir esos espacios y tener esas oportunidades no ha sido fácil. Debemos reconocer el esfuerzo y sacrificio que han hecho muchas mujeres en la historia. Sacrificios que acumulan lágrimas, sudor y sangre. Por eso quiero laurear a esas mujeres que han luchado por el respeto de los derechos de la mujer. Pero también debo reconocer y laurear a los muchos hombres que han luchado por el respeto de los derechos de las mujeres. 
sobre la premisa que la mujer y el hombre son iguales en capacidades y derechos, hago la segunda pregunta. ¿Qué debemos hacer las mujeres en el siglo XXI para que la paz y el desarrollo llegue a todo el mundo? Primero, ser solidarias en todos nuestros espacios. Las mujeres modernas somos multioficios, madres, esposas profesionales, proveedoras y administradoras del hogar. Y es necesario que toda, en todas las actividades que realicemos seamos solidarias, generando oportunidades de estudio y o trabajo para el desarrollo de los demás. Segundo, siempre velar por la paz. Vivir y enseñar una cultura de perdón y reconciliación es deber de todo ser humano. Nosotras como hijas, esposas, madres, lideresas, profesionales, políticas y más, debemos vivir y pregonar una cultura de perdón y de reconciliación. No podemos seguir enemistados para la eternidad por errores o injusticias del pasado. No podemos pasar llorando eternamente por la leche derramada. Enseñemos a las anteriores, a las presentes y a las nuevas generaciones a perdonar. Tercero, promovamos el estudio como base fundamental del desarrollo. El profeta Oseas dijo, mi pueblo perece por falta de conocimiento. ¿Y qué razón tenía? Un refrán popular reza, reza así, el que no sabe es como el que no ve. Y así es la historia del desarrollo, el que tiene el conocimiento tiene el poder. Si nuestros hijos no estudian, están condenados a padecer necesidades y subdesarrollo. Si las niñas no estudian, al igual que los hombres que no estudian, estarán en desventaja en la vida. Por lo que debemos luchar para que haya oportunidades de estudio y desarrollo por igual para niñas y niños. Pero debemos esforzarnos no solo por nuestros hijos, sino por todos los niños y niñas de la comunidad. Porque si los hijos de nuestros vecinos no estudian, nuestros hijos se perderán la oportunidad de tener por socios y compañeros de éxito a sus amigos de la infancia. Todos deben estudiar y nosotros debemos procurar esas oportunidades y debemos procurarlas a todo nivel. Desde el esfuerzo de priorizar la educación para nuestros hijos hasta el esfuerzo de convencer, si fuera necesario, a nuestras comunidades de que todos, sin excepción alguna, deben estudiar. Finalmente, hago la salvedad que en mayor o menor escala de influencias, las mujeres, las mujeres debemos influir en nuestras áreas de trabajo para la construcción del desarrollo y la paz mundial. Y quiero hacer hincapié en que todas las áreas de influencia resultan siendo importantes, por pequeña que se pueda considerar nuestra área de influencia sigue siendo vital e importante. Un ejemplo de pequeñez, pero de vital importancia, es la cadena de huesecillos del oído, el yunque, el estribo y el martillo. Huesos diminutos en el cuerpo, pero vitales en la función de mantener el equilibrio del ser humano. De esta forma, quiero invitar a todas las mujeres a trabajar incansablemente en nuestras áreas de influencia para alcanzar la paz y promover el desarrollo mundial. Muchas gracias. Les deseo muchas bendiciones en sus vidas y en sus hogares. Gracias. Señora Marroquín de Morales, you have pointed out to us that opening up opportunities and education for women and girls is absolutely necessary and can only benefit the world. Thank you very much. And also, my assistant told me that when I was thanking Mrs. Carmona from Trinidad and Tobago, I was muted <laughs> and she didn't hear my thanks. So Mrs. Carmona, I wanted to thank you for reminding us that one of the horrific consequences of war is sexual abuse of women. And this is why we need peace. This is why peace is so vital. So thank you, Mrs. Carmona. And now, um, Laz, we have here a very special guest from Honduras. And I'm very pleased to introduce Mrs. Iroshka Elvir de Nasralla of Honduras. She is a co-founder 
of the Salvador Party of Honduras and the general coordinator of the Youth Secretariat of the Salvador Party of Honduras. She has a master's degree in finance and was Miss Honduras in 2015. Welcome, Mrs. Nasrallah. Muchas gracias. Es un honor para mí estar en este panel. Quiero agradecer a la UPF y a la Madre Moon, una mujer ejemplar, por invitarme como panelista a este webinar para hablar de la contribución de la mujer para encontrar la paz. Me siento dichosa de poder compartir este espacio con destacadas mujeres a lo largo de América Latina. La participación de la mujer es esencial para alcanzar la paz duradera. El pasado 8 de marzo se conmemoró el Día Internacional de la Mujer, un día que nos indica las grandes conquistas sociales y políticas que hemos alcanzado, pero también nos recuerda que debemos seguir luchando por un mundo más justo y equitativo para todos. Sin embargo, para construir una paz duradera debemos fortalecer el sistema de justicia, garantizar el respeto a los derechos humanos, promover espacios para ejercer la plena libertad de expresión y asegurar, por supuesto, la participación política y espacios para la toma de decisiones en donde deben estar precisamente las mujeres. Pero cuando hablamos de la participación política y profesional que tienen las mujeres en nuestras sociedades, no podemos callar que hay un enemigo silencioso entre nosotros, la violencia de género, entre ellos los homicidios, el feminicidio, y la violencia política de género. Eso se ha vuelto cada vez más común en nuestras sociedades. Actualmente América Latina es la región más violenta del mundo, según datos de las Naciones Unidas. Cada dos horas se asesina a una mujer en Latinoamérica por el simple hecho de ser mujer. Y es justamente nuestra región la segunda más letal para las mujeres después de África. Particularmente en Centroamérica se profundiza más el machismo y el patriarcado, que tienden a naturalizar la violencia, perpetuando los estereotipos que se han normalizado en nuestras sociedades. Según el Foro Económico Mundial, estamos a 100 años para alcanzar la equidad de género en el mundo. En Honduras, las mujeres son más vulnerables desde que entró la pandemia debido a la asignación del rol por género, ya que ahora tienen que trabajar más horas para poder cumplir con los quehaceres del hogar. La invisibilización del trabajo doméstico, la falta de corresponsabilidad por parte de la pareja en los deberes del hogar y ahora otro gran desafío. Muchas de nuestras mujeres, un porcentaje importante de ellas que pertenecía a la economía informal, y al implementar las medidas de distanciamiento quedaron desempleadas. Además, hubo un incremento de denuncias por violencia doméstica e intrafamiliar. Nuestras mujeres que pertenecen a nuestros grupos vulnerables hoy son más susceptibles al abuso, explotación, violencia y discriminación. Y por si fuera poco, el Estado no garantiza el derecho a la vida. Y me refiero al reciente caso que conmocionó a Honduras, el asesinato en manos de la policía, de la enfermera de 26 años, Kenia Martínez, quien fue detenida por la Policía Nacional por no cumplir con el ataque, con el toque de queda. Fue encarcelada y horas después llevaron su cuerpo sin vida al hospital argumentando que ella intentó suicidarse, pero el Ministerio Público declaró en su informe que murió por asfixia mecánica, negando que no fue suicidio. Este caso no debe quedar en la impunidad, al igual que el caso de Berta Cáceres, defensora del medio ambiente, y el caso de todas aquellas mujeres que han sido víctimas de este flagelo. Bajo esta premisa, cuando hablamos de la contribución de la mujer hacia la paz, entonces debemos hablar de garantizar los espacios de participación en la toma de decisiones y en los diferentes entes gubernamentales de un país. Promover políticas públicas que garanticen su desarrollo profesional y político y su integridad psicológica, física y económica. No nos han abierto los espacios, nos los hemos ganado con mucho esfuerzo y sacrificio, porque cuando hablamos de paz también tenemos que hablar de justicia y equidad social. 
ya que sin estos elementos en la fórmula no habrá paz. La mujer se ha caracterizado por promover políticas de inclusión y equidad y hemos demostrado con mucho liderazgo nuestra contribución a la resolución de problemas para encontrar la paz. La condición de la mujer en la política es aún más frágil cuando esta mujer es una persona joven, como lo es mi caso. La violencia política de género es una realidad. Los hombres pretenden que no opinemos y mucho menos tomemos decisiones. Sin embargo, al igual que muchas mujeres, he decidido levantar mi voz y hacer incidencia en todos los ámbitos políticos para alcanzar logros que le permitan a la mujer desarrollarse en todos los aspectos. Ha sido un verdadero placer para mí poder compartir con todas ustedes este espacio. Mute myself. Thank you very much, Senora Nasralla. You are boldly standing up for policies that will advance the rights and opportunities for women for a more equitable and just world. Gracias. To officially close the program, I would like to introduce Mrs. Blessy Dakal. Mrs. Dakal is the International Coordinator of the International Association of First Ladies for Peace. She is a Filipino Nepalese entrepreneur and is married to a Nepalese politician, the Honorable Eknath Dakal. She is the founding president of the Nepalese Filipino Association and served as the president of the Nepal Philippines Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mrs. Dakal. Thank you so much, Gail. Honorable First Lady of Central America and the Caribbean, Namaste. The Universal Peace Federation, Women's Federation for World Peace International, Media Friends, Dr. Charles Young, Dr. Julia Moon, and Mrs. Gail Adele Beef. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant day to all. It is my great honor and privilege to give the closing remarks. While today's event is closing, we look forward to further discussion and development on the critical issues raised and discussed. I will now highlight and summarize the contribution of each today's speaker. First Lady, Sibeline Patricia Minis has reminded us of the many injustices that are still present. There are those who do not enjoy freedom of speech and are rid of basic human rights to be here and heard is an opportunity for us to collaborate and drive inclusive initiatives for the betterment of the vulnerable and afflicted. First Lady Kim Simplis Barrow has shared with us how gender equality and women representation are building blocks of peace and sustainable development. Without women taking part in decision-making process, the peace building potential of women will never be fully utilized. First Lady Rima Hari Singh Carmona has been supported this point with statistics from 1998 to 2018. Women only comprised 3% of mediators and 30% of peace negotiators. In her speech, we learned that it is because of this underrepresentation in decision making process, the present system are unable to provide equal career opportunities. To move forward, First Lady Patricia Marquín de Morales has shared that we must forgive the past and present generation in these shortcomings. We must move forward, not just with peace, but also in solidarity with other women as they overcome challenges unique to mothers, daughters, wives, and sisters. Finally, Mrs. Hiroshika Elvir de Nasrallah has, has highlighted to achieve peace, we must strive for social justice and equality. Today, women are still vulnerable. There are women who still suffer from abuse and violence simply because they are women. Moreover, to talk about women's role in peace is to talk about women's participation in government, especially in decision-making. If such opportunities do not readily exist, we must be able to create space where women's voices can be safely heard. 
It is only through women's participation that we can craft policies and design system that promote women's rights and well-being. End of quotes. Today, today's event has been meaningful and vulnerable, and valuable, sorry, because it gives us an opportunity to gather as well as discuss important issues related to the empowerment of women and the direction of our future. This event would not have been possible without S. Klan, Dr. Charles Young, and Mrs. Gail Beath, the presenters and the first ladies who took time to share their insights and our media friends, the Washington Times, and our good audiences. As the session is coming to close, I am optimistic that the discourse on the role of women does not end here. We together, the IFLP, WFWPI, are looking forward in co collaborating with s -Clan to provide more women a voice and space in decision-making process for peace and development. Once again, thank you very much. Have a prayerful, peaceful Holy Week and Namaste. Thank you, Mrs. Dakal, for reminding us of the highlights and insights of all the speeches today from our esteemed panelists. And once again, thank you to all the panelists who've joined us today and to all of our viewers. We have helped, you've helped to make this webinar an amazing success. Let's take the words of these honorable women leaders to heart and work together to build a world of everlasting peace. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moon. Thank you, Ms. Carmona. Thank you, Mrs. Prado. Mrs. Thank Morales. Ms. Lada. Ms. Lada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gracias. Yeah. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, I look forward yes. to that. Yes. Thank you, much. It would be an honor. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. We miss Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Exactly. And they will visit again. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Appreciate it.